uh, quite a... Oh, it's just told me recording's in progress. I got it. Okay. So my name's Chris Roberts. I've managed quite a few uh, tournaments at lots of different levels from my own club. Um, very social players, just trying to... And that's a bit like herding, herding cats, as some of you will know, trying to get people to, to go to the right lawns and come back from lunch quickly and that sort of thing, right up to, um, to big national tournaments. So... The purpose of the exercise here is I'm going to assume, if you don't mind, that we're all starting from scratch. And this is going to be a cut down version of an introduction to tournament management course that I ran, have run a couple of times through the uh, Chiltern Academy at High Wycombe. Um, if, um, so we're, I'm just going to skirt that, that takes all day. And so this is going to be a skim over the topics that I cover at that, um, that, that course, a uh, course which I normally run in conjunction with Frances Coleman, and we're a bit of a uh, double act with it. Um, she keeps me on the straight and narrow barracks from the sideline. Anybody who knows Frances, you know how good she is at that. And um, But unfortunately, she's not here. So um, I think as we're quite a small audience, uh, I know Paul said there'd be Q&A at the end, but if there's anything that you want to jump in with, I might not be able to see your screen, but I think Paul will be able to see you. Um, he can stop me and just say someone who wants to ask her a question. And if, unless I'm going to cover it later on, I'll answer it there and then. All right. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, thanks for coming to this. And um, it's the same sort of introductions as the course, because I'm going to thank you for start off for coming and uh, to a course, which is principally for the benefit of other people. So just like a referee or a coach, you're doing this for the benefit of other people. And without people like yourselves putting yourselves forward in that kind of way, we wouldn't have a sport um, to function. And the same thing with all our, all our admin people who take up uh, CA jobs. So this is, um, yeah, you're doing it for your benefit. I know you wanna run good tournaments yourselves, but actually the sport of croquet is gonna benefit from, um, from you being competent in what you're trying to do. Um, so just to start off, I've got a few definitions, and these are my definitions really, but they fit in with what the CA, um, more or less what the CA make as well. So there's there's words like event, tournament, and competition, which get sort of banded around, and um, with sort of gay abandon, generally, generally speaking, get used to you to mean the same thing. And it's going to be a whole lot easier if we understand what my definition of these things is. So I've got down here that an event is a number of games or matches, usually with the aim of deciding a winner. A tournament is a short duration affair, maybe one or two days or maybe a week, but generally unbroken. So you can think of in, in other sports, you can think of the World Cup in football goes on for a month, but it's a tournament. There's no break in it at all. And a competition is something that goes on for a whole long period, possibly while other things are going on at the same time. So again, if you think in football, they have a league structure where the league goes on for, um, for all year long. Meanwhile, they're playing other things at the same time, other tournaments possibly, or maybe other, other competitions. So you've got two, you've got three things. You've got an event, a tournament and a competition. In this case, we're going to be dealing with, essentially we're going to be dealing with a tournament, but a tournament that's only got one event. Now, some of you, particularly when you play AC, you may go to um, some larger um, tournaments that you'll see on the fixtures calendar. Um, for example, if you go down to Budley Week or Nottingham Week, they will run lots of events within the same tournament. So they might have a doubles event, a doubles handicap, a singles event, and a singles handicap. That might go on all week. And various, some players might sign up for all, for all, three, thing, all three or four things. Some may just come in for one or the other. So you've got lots of events making up a tournament in that case. But what we're gonna deal with really today is one single event tournament all right so that's that um the first thing is getting people to play in your tournament in the first place 
and we'd come on a CA sponsored uh, or CA organized um, seminar. So I'm going to assume that the tournament that you might be running is going to be for the CA, but not necessarily. It might just be within your own club. It, the, 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 the instructions or the, the seminar is going to cover both. But I'll work, first of all, I, I, I always do my tournaments in exactly the same way as even though they're um, possibly based only at my own club, I still do them in exactly the same way as if they were advertised nationally. So you start off by advertising it well in advance when people can put it in their calendars. So in the, C, in the CA's case, you'll be submitting your tournament to the CA calendar for national publicity. You then set an allocation date. I'm looking at faces to see if everybody understands what an allocation date is. So I'm getting lots of nods. And for the sake of the recording, an allocation, there's one, Robert's, Robert's not sure about an allocation. Okay, sorry. Okay, so an allocation date, you have the date you're gonna run the tournament and a date when you're gonna decide who's in it. So you open for entries and you set an allocation date, which means that's the day you're gonna decide which of the which of the applicants, which of the entrants is going to get a place. The beauty of that is you don't have any element of first come first served, because you if you have first come first served, all those people like me who sit sit, sit in front of a computer all day have a distinct advantage over people like my mum, who doesn't even do email and would have to apply for everything by 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 by, uh, by letter. So if you set an allocation date, everybody's got a fair go. Of, uh, of, of time to enter, because on the allocation date, you're gonna be treating all the entries as if they arrive on the same day. The important thing about the allocation date is that's the date you're going to actually do the allocations. So people should understand that they need to apply before the allocation date. They can apply one second before if they like, but they need to do it before, because on the allocation date itself, um, they're, they're late for the allocation. If you've got less people for your tournament than, uh, than advertised, obviously all your applicants get in, get a place. If you're oversubscribed, you need a method of, of deciding which of your applicants is going to get a place and which are going to be on the reserves list. For the sake of the, uh, the CA, they've got some laid down rules for this. If it's a championship, and a, and a championship is a reserved word within the CA, um, I'm going to skip over what, uh, over championships because I don't think any of us are going to be involved in in running championships. But if it's a championship, then things have then allocations have to be made to the players with the highest ranking grade in whichever code, whichever code that is. The rankings are similar to. Um, a handicap, you have a handicap card, you win points and you lose points for winning, win, sorry, you gain points and lose points for winning or losing. The ranking system, for those that don't, aren't familiar with it, is, is the same arrangement. You're rewarded for wins, you're, you get debit points for losing, and you move up and down the rankings. The rankings are run by the WCF, the World Federation, and um, there is a filter for viewing just players based in the UK. Um, the CA also stipulate that if it's not a championship, then all other events, unless it says in the special conditions uh, that you've set, all other events should be by ballot. The snag with ballot is, of course, we don't have anybody policing a ballot. And so um, one can be, uh, one would like to think that all ballots are are fair, um, but if you miss out, then you might wonder um, about the fairness. I don't really want to go into that, but it's you know you, there is ballots have a, a there is a difficulty with ballots. I'd I'd, I'd have to say, um, I prefer to have special conditions which say how you're going to do it, and the in the CA um, uh, series which I'm the director of, we've set the uh, because they're all part of a national competition um we've adopted the championship regulations for the 
golf croquet series. So your your allocations, who gets places, are decided upon the current D grade um, dynamic grade, which is off, off the rankings. So basically, that the short in short terms, the better players get the places, and the weaker players are further down the list. At some point, there's a cut off, and the the weakest are the reserves. Okay. Um, I'd encourage you to have a look at the um, tournament regulations to see how that works. But essentially, it's the better players get the places, the weaker players don't. There are reserved places for the holder of the tournament, um, assuming they're eligible. The manager of the tournament who's given up his, his or her day. So if they're prepared to manage and play at the same time, they get a reserved place. And to encourage younger younger participants, there are also two reserved places for players who are under 25 years of age who wouldn't get in otherwise. Okay. So all of that is going to be dealt with by your tournament secretary, who may well be you. So um, if you're the keen one at your club for running tournaments, it may well be you. So have a look at the role of the tournament secretary which is um, detailed on the uh, ca website you can find it under under the tournament regulations um, we'll skip forward and we'll assume that the tournament secretary has done all their work and we've got the required number of people for our tournament and so and you're the designated manager so about a week or so before the tournament your, your tournament secretary will have written to everybody, to, or sorry, on the allocation date, your tournament secretary will have written to everyone and told them they either have a place or they're on the reserves list. Mm -hmm. if, we're, if we're dealing with the, um, the, uh, an event in the CA calendar, there's a, an icon that you can click on to see all the people who, in the first place, entered, and after the allocation date, they will be listed as players in the event or at the bottom, reserves, okay? Um, your tournament secretary will have, say, have told everybody they're in the event, in the tournament in the first place, and he probably will have, he or she will have said, joining instructions will follow. And that's where you come in as the tournament manager. So you're gonna send out your tournament instructions, um, your joining instructions around about a week or so before the event, because it's a good reminder to somebody that they entered a tournament three months ago and hopefully they put it in their diary. And if they suddenly get a random email and think, oh, crikey, I'd forgotten that, they, then you've got a week for them to, uh, to, to tell you that they're not in it and you can promote a reserve from your, hopefully your list of reserves you've got. So what to put in your joining instructions? Um, I've got a little note here and I'll be sharing some slides shortly, but in your tournament instruction, in your joining instructions, um, I would send um, a list of all the players um, who are going to be in the event so that they can see their names. And the easiest way to do that is to, is to go to the little icon I was telling you on the CA website, if you're running that kind of tournament, and um, click on the little icon and copy the, the, uh, the, the web page address and just paste that into your email. If you're running a tournament for your club, you're going to have to type all those names out that are in it. Um, you need to stress to people the, the importance of, um, of their handicaps. And if they are displaying on the CO website a handicap that's inaccurate, then they should tell you beforehand, because you may well be doing seeding by handicap. I'll come to seeding later on. But it's rather important that that's up to date. People are not particularly good about keeping their handicaps up to date on the CA website. So by sending them a list of, um, of what you think the, the players' names with their handicaps alongside them, it gives them an opportunity to tell you you've got it wrong. And you can tell them the only reason you've got it wrong is because they haven't changed it on the CA website. And they might like to do that. Okay. Um, your joining instructions need to have, I say, a list of, list of the players. Uh, you want to be not everyone's been to your club before so directions to the directions to the venue your car parking arrangements and that kind of thing you'll then set out a timetable give them an expected arrival time 
give them the time of the manager's briefing. I normally say something comical like, arrive at quarter to nine. Nine o'clock is your last arrival time. Manager's briefing, one minute past nine. Okay, just to kind of stress that uh, they should be there by then. Um, you want to state inside in, in your joining instructions any practice times you might have. It might be that if you're running a tournament and people are coming from afar and staying at the B and B down the road, that they you might be able to afford them time to come and practice the day before. You might, on the other hand, uh, have that as a club day and they can't practice the day before. But tell them if they can. It's a nice thing to do. Um, so on your uh, uh, your joining instructions, you want to be telling them, as I say, the the the, the timetable of events. Um, and um, and again, what time you're going late, late, latest? Then what time you're going to start? Standard croquet association start time for a tournament is is nine thirty. And bearing in mind, a lot of croquet players don't read. That's the time you can expect them to turn up. If you want to start your tournament any earlier or later, I would suggest you put it in huge, big red letters because try to draw draw their attention to it. OK, the other one you might want to put into your joining instructions, because this is going to help you possibly later on, is a reminder to players that the tournament regulations require, require that players must be prepared to play until dusk. Probably unlikely, but if you run into trouble with rain or something like that, and you want to run your tournament through till dusk. If you've told people a week a week beforehand, then you shouldn't get they've got no reason to grizzle when you ask them to do it on the day. So that's, I always stick that in as well. Um, you can put in your joining instructions, the number of games expected um, per player. And that's really quite important. Um, some people have got, uh, um, you know, stamina problems and um, better they know beforehand and they can have an, an opportunity to drop out if they've bitten off something more than they can chew. I'll come to that in a minute on how many games you should be planning for, because that really does depend rather on the level of player that you're aiming at. OK, I mean, golf croquet terms, might as well do it now. In golf croquet terms, if you're dealing with a, um, internal club play or sort of a higher handicap players, um, right up to playing in um, the, the um, GC C level series for players with handicaps up to seven. Um, you probably don't want to be scheduling more than six games a day. So it's three before lunch, three after lunch is about right for players with handicaps seven and above. The next strand down in the golf croquet B level series might start to feel a little bit sixes. Sixes are still about right for right for most of them in a single single day event. You could easily play seven or conceivably eight, but you might start getting a few frowns at eight. Once you get beyond the B level series and you get to the A level series for handicaps zero plus and the unrestricted series, which is um, the open series and championships, there's no problem at all. Players are going to expect, to, in fact, they will probably feel a little short done by, or hard, um, short changed, I should say, if they only get six. They're probably looking for seven, eight, possibly even nine games. Okay, so it depends who you're aiming at. Just bear that in mind. Um, we, would, we was on joining instructions still. Um, you do want to write down what the meal arrangement, or what the uh, catering arrangements are. Generally speaking for croquet, it's bring your own lunch, but you might wish to, uh, um, if you've got catering facilities, you may wish to offer that at your tournament. Um, Probably a good idea to sort of give people a bit of a hint as to what um, as to what you'd like them to do. Um, generally speaking, players like in in golf croquet they tend to like to bring their own. Um, I've found in AC sometimes um, the AC are bigger are bigger takers of any any catering that you might offer. AC players tend to be a bit more um, a bit more keen on keen on meals but just to let people know what's expected and what 
what arrangements you might have at your club. You might have some restrictions at your club. We do at my club. Tony's got a big picture of hurling them behind him. Posh clubs like that, we've got arrangements where you're not allowed to bring your own food in because it's a commercial arrangement and they want they want you to buy their own food. So just tell people and then they know what to do. Um, if you're running a, a tournament that's maybe more than a day, I'll say a weekend tournament or a two day during the week, um, you might think, and I think it's always a nice thing to do, is to uh, think about any social arrangements for players who have come to a tournament by themselves and are going to be sort of wandering back to a lonely b and You might want to arrange um, to all those that want to, to go out to local local pub or local restaurant or something. So you could put on that. I normally put at the bottom of my two day events that there'll be a sign up sheet for a for a meal out a, a tournament meal out somewhere for those that are interested. And then people have got a a pre plan of what they might want to do. So that's your joining instruction. Um, coming on then to um, your players all nicely turned up at your tournament, hopefully. And um, you want to be preparing your paperwork really rather well. Um, I'll come to some really useful latest um, um, additions we've got of some standard paperwork, which is available for you. Um, we are in the process of trying to cover all the likely scenarios of how many players we're likely to get, uh, because it's going to be very much dependent on how many courts you've got available, I say uh, what level of player you're aiming at and how and what the duration of your tournament is. So we'll come to a minute and I'll have to try and work it, um, show you how to look at the CA website yourself. But we've got some standard paperwork now, which we've designed specifically for the um, the golf croquet series, um, where we're trying to encourage people to use the standard paperwork and a standard management formats so that when people go to uh, one turn one uh, tournament in a series um it's rather they don't know what to expect what format to expect so we've got um some standard paperwork set up for one and two day events and the standard kind of number of people that we should that we frequently expect i think we've got we've got um standard paperwork for uh uh fields of, of 14 players 16 players 20 players and right up to 24 players. The one I want to get in is uh, one for 12 and eight, because I think that's going to be very useful for clubs, particularly clubs that have got less than four courts. Okay. Um, so the, the standard paperwork that we will show you, and I can um, start off with, hopefully if I do my first screen slide, all the paperwork starts off with the same style front sheet. And the front sheet is 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 a dull sheet, and it and um, but you want to draw players' attention to it because it's it's the one that is going to make your tournament function properly. And frequently, for me, um, tournaments are missing an explanation of how the tournament is going to run. Um, so I'll just try and share an example. Um, if I can, once I get one up, we'll be all right. I've just got to find each one. Uh, it's number slide number one, which is at the at the end. I think. Just a moment, spare with me. I'm putting my water. On. There it is. So I share that. Okay. So I'll come out first of all. So there's your. There's. I don't know if you. I'll, I'll zoom into whatever you say is is, is right for you. Um, so. Can people read that? I want me to zoom in on it. Come in a bit more. Zoom in a bit. Zoom. Yeah, a bit of zoom yeah. would help. Oh, okay. Try and zoom in a bit more. There we go. How's that? Are That's we getting good. there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I try and make the term. If you can make your paperwork as neat as possible, then um, your players are going to have confidence in you know what you're doing. Even if you even if you think you're flying by the seat of your pants, they're going to have confidence in it because it looks good. All right, I think that's a little tip I can give you. There are there are several managers who are perfectly good managers, but their paperwork's a mess, and so nobody has any confidence in them. But actually, they're really quite good managers. So it works two two ways around. 
if you can be neat and tidy, your players, I think, are going to have a lot of confidence in you. OK, so um, pretty straightforward. This is what kind of tournament it is. I like to get this one up straight, straight, straight at the beginning. A, a drawn result is usually not an acceptable result. So you don't want people troop, trooping off the lawn and saying, Mrs. Miggins and I drew four all. That's not very helpful, all right? Because um, croquet, croquet is a game that, that is won by people. Uh, invariably, you don't want to have draws presented to you. So make sure that people, you get that one up um, right at the beginning. Usually then players will want to know whether there are any time limits. So the second thing I put up is whether or not you're going to run timed games or not. It's better, croquet is a game designed really not to be timed and time limits should only really be used if you really think it's necessary. Um, if, you've get, if, you work, if you've worked a sensible format, you're not going to break people in half too much with the, with the format you're trying. Um, if let's suppose you're going to run um, a weakish a weakish level tournament, say to um, up, up up to up to na uh, the C level standard, um, where you've got competent players, obviously very competent players at C level, but um, they're not you, you're not you're not going to tax them with too with too heavy a day. Um, game cro golf croquet games should take around about and you know fifty minutes to an hour. All right. So there's not usually a need to time if you're only going to put, put um, um, you're only going to put six games on a day. There shouldn't really be a need to time things. But this is quite important. If you're going to have untimed games, I, this is the way I would describe it. Games are not normally timed. However, time limits may be introduced to one or more games to facilitate the smooth running of the tournament. AMD. AMD is a lovely thing. You'll get used to that. AMD means at manager's discretion. All right. So if you put it in there, then it gives you license to um, to add things on as you're going along. Importantly, if you're running a a, um, a CA listed tournament under tournament regulations, and I would suggest you do, even if it's at your own club, because if you're making things up, You've got nothing to draw back on. If you if you tell everybody you're running it to the CA tournament regulations, even though it's at your own club, then um, you've you've got something to. If anybody grizzles, then you can blame the CA rather than they think you've made it up. So what I would say here is that you, there's a slide I've got coming along a bit later on, which is to know your time limits. There are time limits that you're you you mustn't go below. So in a golf in a golf croquet one, we've got um, that. Um, so I'll come to the slide on, on time limits, but you, you, the game has to have elapsed for a certain period before you can impose a time limit on it. So there's two kinds of time limits. You either in time, impose time limits before you start, and all the games are timed, and you tell players that at the beginning, or you have no time limits, but you reserve the right to impose one on any game that's being a problem. So we'll just deal with that second scenario. If time limits are going to be introduced mid game, at least, and this should say 45 minutes if you're single banked or 50 minutes if you're double banked. So I've set it up because most of it's going to be double banked at most clubs. Uh, we've got more players than, than courts. So as long as 50 minutes has gone by, then you can give players a, a, you can introduce a time limit, but the time limit must be not less than 15 minutes. So you give people a warning that they're now on a time limit of, and I would say 15 minutes, and then remind them that what happens when time is called. They should know all this. It's all in the rules. But if you're running a club event where people won't have played time limits before, you tell them that when time is called, players can play a further eight strokes that's two strokes with each ball less any forfeited, forfeited by faults after which the game of the score will be taken as the result if after these eight strokes the game is tied play, play will continue until a deciding hoop is scored because remember every game must produce a winner all right Generally speaking, people won't read this, 
So you might want to point it out to them so that when you do introduce a time limit, they don't think you're being dreadfully unfair because you told them about it beforehand. And of course, you've got it on, on your notice. All right. And this is where your notice is going to come in really handy, because if people don't read it, you can just go and say, I told you to read that. Go and read it. You've got to remember that croquet players don't read unless they're actually pointed in the direction of a notice. OK, it's a standard kind of croquet players don't read. It's a joke, but it's actually also true. Then you want to explain the tournament format. OK, and we've gone here for a really simple one. This is an eight player. I've called it eight player paper tournament because it's part of a, a paper exercise that we run on the course. So you're going to tell people it's going to be two blocks of four. OK. And then you're going to tell them how what how you're going to decide who wins the block. And this is really important having this this displayed because it's 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 the players guarantee that the manager knows what he's doing or she's doing. It's the players guarantee that, you, that the manager isn't making it up as he goes along. It's a guarantee that nobody's going to be um, unfairly advantaged, we'll say, because, you know, that you've got a suspicion he's the manager's friend or something like that. You know, it's all laid down beforehand. But most of all, as well, it's also an aid memoir for you. So when you come to sort your blocks out, you can check that you are doing the right thing by following these steps. All right. And the steps that we've got, we'll come to that later, but they're all listed here as to how we're going to sort out the, the blocks in the event that a sheer number of wins doesn't decide it. So you've got two blocks of two box of four all play all. And then the second phase after lunch, in this case, not a single day tournament, is the top two in each block will progress to the main knockout to contest positions one to four. And the bottom two in each block will progress to the plate knockout for positions five to six. So everybody knows or should know what's going to happen. It won't stop people coming up and asking you to explain it again, even though it's really simple. But it's all laid down for, for the players. All right. And then this one is really important at the bottom. You put this in. If unforeseen circumstances prevail, Loss of time due to the weather, for example, all of the open, all of the above will be open to change A and D. So even though this is what you set out to do, you've given yourself license to alter things if you absolutely have to. And so just getting that in there is really important. OK, if you print, if you if you print nothing, if you if you should explain everything you're going to do, but you've got to have that at the end. Otherwise, somebody could grizzle at you that you 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 were doing something you didn't ex, didn't explain. Right. So that's this is all your paperwork you've you you've got. If you're going to use the standard CA paperwork, I'm pleased to say that this is all printed for you. All right. So um, you don't need to make too many notes. If you already got to do, I'll direct you um, at the end to the CA standard paperwork, and you can have a look at that and print it all off. The printed, the, the versions you can print off, there is a PDF version for people who like to do things with a pen and paper. And there's, and it's all driven from um, an Excel document where you can actually type the, the, the player's names in and the whole thing self-populates. And if you've got a computer and a printer there with you on the day, you can actually print things or put things in on the, on the computer and print out um, documents for the second and third stages as you go along. Okay, so just try and see if I can find the next slide. Unfortunately, they're not, uh, not in a fabulous order. So um, we want number, number five next. Forgive me a moment. There it is. So your players have turned up and you told them there's going to be a manager's briefing. And so what are you going to tell them? So they've all turned up on time. So the first thing is, um, is obviously a nice welcome. Then um, the important but boring stuff is the health and safety, safety business. 
So you might have some slippery slope, slopes, particularly when you go to, I'm, I'm minded when you go to Hampsworth, um, there's a shortcut you can take if you're brave enough down the very big slope. But um, Richard and Janet down there always tell everyone to use the path. People don't use the path, they still go down the slippery slope. But if you've told them and they fall down the slippery slope, it's not your problem, is it? You've actually told them, all right? Um, I would really hope that player, that clubs, some it's a bit awkward. If you're sharing with a bowls club, perhaps um, you have to have string boundaries. If you're not sharing with a bowls club and you've got any control over your surface at all, really don't have string boundaries. They're a strip hazard waiting for things to happen. At this point, Francis comes in and tells a story how she broke two ribs in South Africa. Um, so, you know, you, you're leaving yourself open to, well, your players open to injuries and um, conceivably yourself's open to um, all sorts of claims and things. So string boundaries um, on bowls lawns, perhaps um, pinned down a lot, I would suggest if you use them. Um, but that's your health and safety stuff. Um, you're going to put, you're going to welcome, um, welcome in. You're going to tell them all about your host club information, where the loos are, any special um, rules that are to be observed at the club. When Tony's going to his big club there at Hurlingham, you know, they they they, they certainly won't allow you to be uh, taking your shirt off, or probably won't even allow you to wear bare, wear, to have bare feet. All that kind of thing that you might want to put in if your club is stiff on that kind of stuff. Um, do tell people where the courts are and what number number the courts are because you're probably going to put court um, court numbers on your paperwork and if people don't know where court number one, two and three are, then you've got to tell them. Um, and I say the briefing will be very very dependent on the on the experience of the players. The better players, the less needs to be said. The uh, if you're running tournaments with a with conceivably players playing in their very first tournament, you've got to express to them that this is a little bit different to the average knock-up that they might come along or the average mix-in that they go to with their chums. This is, this is, this is a tournament played to the, to the full and proper rules, okay? If you've got a referee, hopefully you might be a referee yourself, if you've got a referee, they need to know when to call the referee, okay? Um, want to really labor the point that they should be calling a referee on their own their own um their own strokes that might be that could even even be could be false and if they don't call a referee themselves then their partner should forestall them and call a referee um in good time um if in doubt call the referee i really emphasize that for for weaker players who just may not think it's important when of course we all know it is um, we you can draw attention to the notice that we had prepared earlier on on the notice board. Run through this, but refer to the notice board. Um, remember, croquet players don't read. Um, um, and it's just running, just throwing through the obvious stuff that you've already print, you've already printed off. Um, it's the winner's responsibility to report the result. Okay, so frequently, you know, you can find yourself waiting on a result, and two players have gone off the lunch. And that's really awkward because you're trying to do your, your paperwork for the afternoon. You've got to go and find them to find out what happened in the results. So make it the responsibility of the winner to, um, to report the result. Um, generally, I don't like people writing on the, on the score sheet, but if you're playing yourself particularly, then you do want somebody to write the results up. We'll come to the paperwork in a minute. You will have a list of all the games in order. And you can say to players, please put your results on the play, on the order of play. Don't allow the players to fill in the, the, the block, all right, because they'll do it wrong. <laughs> if you've got a string on a pencil, make sure the pencil only reaches the area you want them to fill in. <laughs> it doesn't reach the blocks, all right? That's usually quite a good one. Um, scoring clips. Um, the croquet world seems to be a bit divided on croquet, on scoring clips. Some people like them and some people don't. Um, you're the manager. You make the rules. I would strongly recommend that you have a mandatory use of scoring clips by both players. And I, I normally mention, I acknowledge that some people don't like it. I normally say, 
hard luck today. Scoring clips are mandatory. And the reason for that is because if you've got one side putting a scoring clip on and the other side not putting a scoring clip on, it doesn't mean uh, when you get halfway around, halfway around the course and there's a dispute as to what the score is, somebody says, well, who, I, I ran hoop three, but I forgot to put a clip on. Well, and the other guy says, no, I'm the man who's not putting clips on. And I ran hoop three. And they'll call you on as the manager to sort it out and you can't help them. So scoring clips for both players gets round all that, okay? And to make it easy for you, uh, for all the players, and for you as the manager to know what the score in the game is, which is going to be important because you want to know whether a game is near completion or not, I would follow the convention to tell people the primary clips go on the top of the hoop and the secondary clips go on the side. All right? This is for everyone's benefit, so the players know what the, what the score in the game is, you as manager know what the score of the game is, and the vast crowd of spectators that is going to turn up can also enjoy the tournament. Okay? Make sure that everybody, tell everybody they should have ball markers and a divot tool. People frequently don't have a divot tool. You may have some... Uh, we, we managed to buy a whole load of really cheap ones made of bamboo. If you go onto um, um, uh, eBay or Amazon, you can buy um, cheap divot mark, divot tools. They're about 10 pence each if you buy enough. You can give everybody one, you know. Everybody should have a divot tool in their pocket. And particularly, everybody should have ball markers. And again, you know, you can go and buy these things for nothing and then give them away to players i would um any ask me if there's any questions at the end, end of your briefing right the next slide is um thankfully we're going to get on to actually running the tournament so the next slide is number six. Oh, new share sorry new share slide number six is that one running the tournament Okay, running a tournament. So the important thing is going to be keeping to time. Okay, um, pro game players get very engrossed in their own game, and they get they get very, they get very um, uh, self centered, if you like, on their own enjoyment. And you're there to make everybody's tournament enjoy enjoyable. So you need to know. Um, I would suggest on the order of play sheet in the left hand margin where you've got all the games listed if you can note the time that every game starts because then if you do have to go and impose a time limit on a on a single game that's delaying you know then that they've had their regulation 45 or 50 minutes and you're then empowered to go and put a time limit on if you don't make a note of when the time is or how long they've been going you can't really start putting a, a time limit on a game of, that's been going for an uncertain time. We'll come to come to time limits. I've got a separate sheet on uh, knowing your time limits. Okay. Bear in mind that some players are very slow. Okay. So some people have reputations for being slow. Um, identify if you can slow players and keep an eye on them. All right. And if they're playing slowly. You're the manager. It's your, your your job. You tell them that they're playing slowly. They'll probably be embarrassed and they'll probably speed up a bit. But tackle them early if they appear to be taking a long time. All right. You are empowered, or a, re a referee is empowered to. Um, there are in, within the rules. There are penalties for playing too slowly, and it's a and it's it's um is an a cumulative. Uh, penalty uh, along the same lines as the um, the behaviour rules and transgressions mean um, uh, is a cumulative effect. So you end up with first of all, it's a nice a nice mention that somebody's being a bit slow. Then you can start getting into you are seriously playing slow. It's a bit of a warning, and then you end up if you have a look in the rules. There's all sorts of things that the re referees can do with regard to timing and that kind of thing. And ultimately, there's sanctions for players to be um, uh, penalised 
with missing strokes and um, missing hoops and ultimately losing games. But you don't want to get to that. It won't get to that. But if you if you speak with the slow players quickly and early enough, then you shouldn't end up in the problem. Um, knowing who's available to play, you've got a you'll have an um, uh, an order an order of who, of play. Um, And it's usually and it's put into rounds. So when when a player has played finished playing gate round one against their name in round two, just put a little dot because that means they're available. All right. And then when their opponent um, finishes their first round game, you can put a little dot against them. Say, great, I've got two little dots against the against the game in round two. I can get that game on straight away. All right. So um, be aware that um, players will sit around for ages. And when you put them on to court, they'll say, oh, I just need to go and get have a cup of tea or I just need to go and use the loo when they could have done that a long time ago. All right. So just chivvy people along, you know, come on, you could have done that ages ago is a good line. You know, um, uh, court allocations. Um, who plays on what court? Ideally, no no player should play on the same court twice in succession, particularly in the early part of the tournament. Um, you can have a court allocation sheet where you can keep a note of which players have played on which uh, which sheet. That's just a general box of um, like a like a grid where you can write down who's played on what court. Um, but I would say, really, players get very um, you know, oh, I, I haven't played on court three yet. And unless your courts have appreciably different playing characteristics, uh, perhaps one or more are undersized or they're mown differently, it really isn't the, pro the problem that some players think it is. All right, you've played on court one, you've now required, you've played two games on court one, you're now required to go and play on court two. Well, just, you know, it's more, I say I've, I've written down here, it's more of a mind thing. But generally, generally, if you can move players around the best you can, that works. And if necessary, if you've got a situation where one, you've only got one court left, everyone else is off playing, um, and there's a choice of which court to go on, which means one one player is going to play on the same court in succession, the other person is going to have to move. Just toss a coin in front of them and get on with it. You know, it's not the big problem that people try and think, try and make of it. The um, who get, who gets to play on what court. Lunches is where it all falls apart. Your lovely planning and everything you've got usually falls apart at lunchtime. For some reason, um, players seem to think it's absolutely necessary to take three quarters of an hour to eat one round of sandwiches. You know, um, if you've got catering, um, some somebody at your club's prepared a lovely lunch, and everyone got, feels obliged to take 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 part in it. Um, it's pr you know. Players coming late back from lunch is probably not going to be your fault. You can blame the caterers or blame the players, put, but put the onus on the players to return to the courts by a specific time. OK, put up a notice. I need you back at this time because it tends to all fall apart at lunchtime. OK, and then we had the business about playing till dusk. Um, unlikely, but you've told players at the beginning and you hopefully told them at the briefing as well. If you have to peg down peg down games, this is more for AC where games go on a long time, but you could conceivably have to peg down a golf croquet game. There's a sheet that you can download from the um, the Croquet Association website, which I'm about trying to show you. New share. Where's the peg down sheet? There it is. It's fairly rudimentary. It just it just reminds players uh, this is all this is all meant for um, for AC, so it'll tell you which ball is for which hoop next, who's who's to play next, whether there are any bisques in hand for either player, and the remaining time. But you can still use this chart to plot the positions of of the balls in golf croquet as well. All right, and that's so that you can. Um, you you may have to uh, uh, say halt a game overnight, for example. Um, I can't think of another an, another reason. The, conceivably, in in AC, 
you might end up with one game that's holding things up, but you do want that game to finish. So you could actually peg a game down in order that you can start a whole new round and you can come back to the peg down game later. People can replace the balls and carry on with the time they had left. Okay, so moving on quickly, so I'm realising we're going to be rattling along with the time. Um, the next one is slide seven. Slide seven. Knowing your time limits. I mentioned earlier on, um, all of this stuff is in the tournament regulations, so I've pulled just bits out of it, but um, and I can share some of these slides with you. So you can decide whether you're going to have time limits or not before the game or, or during it. Um, and we ran through how long time had to go before you uh, before you could you could impose a time limit. You've got standard time limits set by the CA. Um, manager may impose time limits um, on games. So in for, for AC, for a single game, you've got to, you've got to allow um, two and a half hours for level play or three hours for handicap play. All right. That's the unless you've advertised it previously in your in your um, your special conditions. Um, you've got various different um, uh, time limits for um, short games that start off shorter in the first place. So an 18 point game, for example, and different size courts, different size time. All of this stuff, I won't go through, but it's all in the tournament regulations. Um, for golf croquet, we, we touched on your standard time limit was 45 minutes for a 13 point game or 50 minutes if double banked. Okay. And how then to introduce a time limit um, during a game. Um, it, say there's there's a, a, another one on time limits for best of threes, which is a cumulative time limit, um, generally disliked by the players because you end up with not enough time in the third game. And that's the interesting one that's going to decide the tie. So I try and avoid that cumulative time limit. It's listed under other forms of play. It tends not to be that popular. Right, rattling on. Um, slide eight. So you've got to bear in mind this is a course. Normally we're doing uh, exercises and things while we're going along here. So this is all a bit dry. What can possibly go wrong? Okay, a player alive arrives late. It happens. Yeah. So see the tournament regulations for the power of the manager. What the manager can do for that with that player. Okay, there are lots of sanctions um, that the manager can impose on the player. Um, it, it's usually not the player's fault. So let's be a bit human about it. But yeah, there are some players, there's not many, thankfully, who are serially arrived late and just don't give a monkeys for anybody else. And they really need sorting out. So that so these sanctions are meant for those types of player. Thankfully, they're very few. Um, you've got to decide what you're going to do with any, any games that are missed. Um, generally speaking, if you're playing a block, it's really, un it's really, you do really want to want the games to be played. So I'm going to assume that this player player arriving so late that you don't know what that you've got to award the game is unlikely. They're they're you're likely to be able to catch up. I've been I've been to a tournament where a manager is under the old under the AMD. The manager um, penalised a late playing a late playing uh, late arriving GC player by starting his first game from corner two and saying, saying, OK, late player, you're, you're, you're two nil down. And he started from corner two rather than corner four, where you normally start, started at the opposite corner. And the assumption was he's late and he's lost two. He lost the first two hoops. Bit of a heavy sanction, but you're the manager. You could actually do that. All right. Uh, it's not in tournament regulations. So don't I would suggest only doing that at your club. All right. It's um, but it's just a little example of what I saw a manager do once. And I thought it was quite innovative. Um, but you can't do that if it's a CA tournament. Um, there are lots of implications when resolving incomplete blocks. We haven't got time to go through them now. Um, just generally try not to um, try not to have an incomplete blocks. If a player withdraws very late on the morning of your tournament, leaving you no time to rejig your format or draws, or no time to call up a reserve, 
then you have to play with a buy, okay? And the buy, um, the opponent of the buy and a knock, the opponent of the late of the missing player in a knockout just gets a buy through to the next round. In a block, you just have to play the block one short. So somebody has a sit out when they would be playing the absent player. I'll come to a Swiss right at the very end because that's the, the Swiss I call the manager's friend. And it's a format that gets you out of a lot of trouble. If a player withdraws um, mid tournament, hopefully it'll be because of injury. Well, not for them, but hopefully it'd be because of injury or sickness or some other reason. If it happens um, and you've got them in a block and you haven't finished the block, all you do is you discount all of that player's games. So you just put a line through all their games on the block uh, horizontally and vertically. And when you come to add up the block, you just take out all the results that they've had so far because they haven't played everyone. And so the block is resolved by dint of missing all their games out. Any games that they have played are still valid for handicap cards and for the rankings, if need be. It's just that for the for the calculation of the block, you can't have them included because they haven't played everybody. Um, if the weather interrupts your tournament in England, that happens, you know, not not frequently, but every now and again, you can. As a manager, you can say, right, OK, we need to get to the end of the tournament. And I we're at a point where I can't alter the format. So we're going to make all games from now on seven points rather than 13 points in golf. OK, are we all familiar with seven point games in golf? Probably a lot of our mixings play seven games, but seven points, don't they? Uh, and you could go down to a reduced game in AC. So rather than a 26 point game, you could play shorter games. There are various shorter games that AC players would be familiar with. 14 point is, is quite a common one. It's kind of half game. I'll tell you, if it's not possible to reduce the games, um, concentrate on, on getting the games played. Suppose you go down to only having one court left. You started off with three or four courts and only one court is left. All the others got puddles on. Concentrate on playing the games that matter. So that's saying, hard luck all the players who haven't been doing so well. I'm afraid there's not enough that courts for you to play. Concentrate on getting the, the games that matter between those players still, still within a chance of winning, at winning the event. Um, concentrate on them. It may be you have to cut the field and say, I'm just going to concentrate on those that can win. All right. And as I say, then there's lovely AMD at managed discretion. You can do what you think best for the benefit of everyone. Um, going on to the new share again, number nine is number nine is the importance of seeding. This is where we're actually going to get into running, run actually going to run a tournament. So we're going to run, we're going to the importance of seeding. So if you if you, you can just use a blind draw. OK, particularly if you've got handicap play, you should have a blind draw. So just pulling pulling names out of a hat. You've done it beforehand, beforehand, hopefully. And that's where uh, people have come out in the draw. You can do a draw in front of everybody with a packet with a player pla a pack of playing cards. Just um, pair, pair the cards off and those people play a, 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 in, a, in a draw that you draw in front of everyone. But in level play, seeding is really important for a balanced tournament and how to do a seeded draw. OK, I think the best thing is if I switch now because we haven't got so long is switch to the actual a tournament structure. So we're going to go to um, so it's come up next. OK. We'll go to number 10 and that gives us that says the one we're really interested in. So it's got some colours on it. So you'll like this. OK, so how do we if we're going to do blocks, how do we we got all our players in seeding order? So it could be that you're doing your seeding on a ranking grade, if all the players have got ranking grades. If they haven't, they've almost certainly got a handicap, so you can put them all in handicap order. You can be, you can, you can, 
develop that still further by putting them in handicap order. And then if any, anybody's got the same handicap as the next player, put them in the order of their index points that they've got that go with their handicap. So you've got your players in handicap order. And this is really important how you're going to decide who goes in which block and where. So your top C goes into block A. And then you run across, you go one, two, three, four. Okay. And um, what managers who don't think about it do is they then go left to right again. They go five, six, seven, eight. And then over, over again to the blue, nine, 10, 11, 12. All right. If you continually put the strongest person on each row in block A, block A is going to be much stronger than the yellow block here. So what we do is we zigzag. So you come across here like that, and then you go back the other way. Back across, and then back the other way. Tournament regulations refer to it as striping. So you stripe the blocks. The beauty of that is if you add all those numbers up, they're your seeding numbers, they all add up to the same number, which shows you then that your, your block is, all, all blocks are as even as you can make them. Similarly, if once you've got your players in, if you put your players in with their, with their handicaps in brackets after them, and you add up all the handicaps vertically, you'll find the numbers will be very similar. Okay, and that's the best you can do to make a seeded block. All right. This is this just um, that's for that's for that's how you would do sixteen players. Then then we want to do um, this example. We've got um, yeah the uh, example below um, uses just eight players. Okay, um, just working what this says. Uh, seeded blocks on the block. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so you've got all your players in your blocks. How you're going to order, this is, this is why I missed it. So how to get an order of play. Now, there's a trick here. You want to make sure that everybody in the block plays, the, plays everybody else in the block. And I've done it, I've done it for, an, you suppose you've got an eight-person block. So you've got eight, an eight-person tournament and you want everyone to play everybody by the end. The secret is you've, these are your seed numbers, okay? So we're just doing a single block now, rather than this one was for four blocks, this is a single block. You start off with number one there, okay? And I've put number one in red for a reason. So you go number one there, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So in the first round, Player number one is going to play against player number eight. Okay. Player two will play seven, three will play six, four will play five. In the in the round two, you leave player one where he is and you move everybody else round, round one. So number two goes from that slot to that slot. And number three similarly goes round one. Is everybody with that? So you rotate everybody around one, except you leave number one where he is. Okay? So in round one, player number one plays player eight. In round two, player number one, one plays player seven. In round three, number six will have moved over to play number one. And everybody moves around one. But the important thing is to leave player number one alone. When you get round to set who, when you get round to round seven, everybody will have played everyone. And pleasingly, there'll be a last round pairing of seed one against seed two, which if everybody's played to their seeding, both those players will be undefeated. And that is the best prediction you've got for the deciding game. I can't see everybody. Is everybody kind of happy with that? Yeah. 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 Anybody, anybody not? Okay. But that's the really easy trick to make sure that 
you get the right people playing in the last round. Um, there's that if you that's if your tournament is sing solely a block, and all you care about is who wins the block, because though that is going to be the winner of the event. All right, and we and we had earlier on how we resolve to win a block. It could be that your block um, is to determine who goes through to the next phase or who goes through to the, the cup knockout or the plate knockout. Yeah. If you're going to have, say, four people qualifying from a block, then the game that you want to have played last is actually the game between players four and five. Because if everybody's played to their seedings, players one, two, and three should have qualified already by now, before the last round. But this is what we would call the sticky game. The sticky game is going to be between the two players who are, as best you can predict beforehand, are on the cusp of qualifying. So you want that game to be last. So what you could do there is work your last game, your last round out first, and then work all your other rounds backwards yeah. to round one, moving everybody anti-clockwise. Yeah. yeah? Yeah. Okay. That's that. Um, if you've got um, a uh, seeds to a knockout, we could then come forward and say, so the block block finishing pre precedence, this is a repeat of what we've got on our, our opening, opening um, sheet. Okay. And then when I'm running a course, we do we do a blocks to seeds to block exercise. Now, a seeds to block exercise. Let's go back here. Once we put all the seeds in 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 blocks, and suppose we're running a tournament at our own club, and Mr. Miggins happens to be seed four, and Mrs. Miggins is seed twelve. Well, they don't really. You don't really want to have a tournament where somebody plays their their wife, do you? So you can, as the manager, you can move people around a little bit for the benefit of everyone's enjoyment. If if we need to move Mrs. Miggins out of seed twelve position, we could swap Mrs. Miggins over with um, seed sorry seed eleven, and put her there and put the seed 11 in place. And therefore somebody hasn't got to play their wife. All right. <laughs> you can do that in club tournaments. You can't really do it in CA tournaments. All right. Yeah. It's just a nice little convenience. Yeah. Um, you might do it if you had um, tournaments where um, people have come from another club to play at your club. It's not a CA event. Um, you are empowered to move people around the lower grade tournament that you're running so for the weaker players the nicety of moving players around so they don't play somebody from their own club is is a nice thing to do but do do it at the lowest possible level don't move seed one and two around or the top row if you can possibly avoid it all right um that's just a nice little nicety um so then we come on to um, we do a blocks to C dot exercise. And if we're going to do blocks leading to a knockout, we end up with this sort of thing. So this is our 16 player, knock, 16 player knockout that we had. You've got blue one is your top seed. Blue two was your second seed. They both won their blocks. That's where they end up. OK. And again, all this is on the CA website. Um, there are um, this is stuff that you need to know what's going on in the background, but um, we've got it all on standard paperwork for you that self populates through. But generally speaking, and the, generally speaking, if you do this do this correctly and the right people have got through to the blocks, then you can see that once again, um, seed one seed one plays seed seven, and seed eight plays seed two. Because you can't have people in the same uh, in the same um, um, slot. You know what you know what you know, you want to avoid. Blue blue one has already played two already this morning. You you keep them in opposite halves so they don't reach each other, meet each other till they get to the final.
Okay. Um, that's pretty well that. The last thing then is to look at the standard paperwork that I've been banging on about. So here I've got saved as a PDF somewhere. Where's the PDF version? Uh, let's not bother with the PDF one. Let's do, that's the setup. So can you see this? And if I change screens, you can see that here. Yeah. Okay. So this is the standard paperwork that we've got. Um, and it starts off with your info sheet. Yeah. Okay. Um, the standard paperwork allows you to fill that in. So you put, put what event it is. This is, this is your games will not normally be timed. What's going to happen if it's a timed game? The, what happens at the expiry of time? Your tournament format, how you're going to sort your blocks out. And, your, and our lovely notice at the end about we can change what we like because we put AMD there. It then the standard paperwork then gives you a list of players, which I've populated already for the tournament that I ran today. And this, the, the this, the as long as you put all this, all these names in in the right columns, and you seed them by their D grade, okay. Um, is a, is a nicety way of putting your, your your club name down there so everyone can get this. Um, you can see you can seed players by the handicap or by D grade. D grade is easiest. This is what I've done, and by putting the players' names in here, they're already now populated into blocks for you. Okay, by putting them in the right slots, there they they flow over into these positions. All right. So at that point, you go, oh crikey. Um, I don't know. Let's have a look. Um, we've got. We did. I did have one earlier on where um, Helen Essa it was. Is actually lives with Paul Young uh, with Paul Paul Rob, their partners, and so I actually swapped Helen Essa and Alistair Broom over so that they weren't in the same same uh, event because it was a low level tournament that one can do that with. In fact, I didn't. I didn't do that. I beg your pardon. I swapped her with Christine Searle because they were the same. Um, sorry, uh, with um, sorry, Hillary Cowley. They were the same handicap, and so uh, and they both had the same D grade as it happened. So that worked all right. So you, you work all that through. Um, the next slide I've got is actually shows what happens when we get a few results, um, which is. Um, dummy results here we go share that one share that one so here we've got um i'll put the results in just done block a okay so block a um we put some results in and as we put the results in this this gives us sorry i should have before we got to where we were this was um so we started off with the list of players they flowed into they flowed into the into the into the blocks, filled the blocks in, and we were given an order of play as well. And this is all just worked out for you, but at least you know the methodology by which it's done. You keep the number one in one place, and you revolve the other players around number one. So I've put put in some random scores here. Um, the system is clever enough that when there's a seven in 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 the place. It then promotes it promotes the result through to the blocks. Here's our blocks. I've just got to move your lovely photos out of the way. Right there we are. So we can see here pretty straightforwardly that Carol Jamieson won three games in my dummy dummy scenario here. Um, net hoops. Net hoops is really important. It's not just the hoops she scored. It's the hoops she scored less the hoops she conceded so if you're doing this by pen i would write in in here just just where my little cross is there i would write a little tiny plus 21 and then count her and her numbers downwards and so she's let in uh what's that four five six seven eight nine 
So you've got 21 plus 21 minus 9 gives her a net hoop score of 12. All right. In this case, we don't really care about the net hoops because this block has been resolved by the, purely on game wins. All right. So Carol comes first. Hillary comes second. The other Carol, Carol Wadsworth comes third. And Kevin had a poor time and he lost all his games and he uh, and he came fourth. In actual fact, that turned out to be completely wrong. Kevin actually won all his games today and won the, won the cup. But <laughs> there we go. I didn't know that beforehand. I just put some random results in. By putting the results in here, if you've if you've got a computer handy, and I don't suppose many of you will, but if you've got a computer handy, it actually populates the main knockout, which looks like that. I need to make this bigger or smaller, do I? Let me see if I can get rid of um, that, then it's bigger. That's right. Okay, that's it. So in your knockout, you've got a cut down version of what we had before, uh, cut down before. A1 goes to the top, A2 goes to the bottom. B B one goes there, B two goes uh, B two goes there. So each each of the um, uh, or everybody in block the two people in block A are kept apart until they reach the final, and the two in block B similarly are kept apart until they reach the final. What you've got here as well is what happens to the and this is really important. What happens to the people who lose the quarter final? They paid their money. They need six games as well. So you've got, if you win, you go through to the semi-final, and if you win the semi-final, you go through to the final, and there's a third place playoff. Yeah. If you lose the quarter-final, you come down to the Shield semi-final yeah. for positions fifth to eighth. Yeah. If you win that, you're in the Shield final for positions fifth to sixth. And there's a playoff for seventh and eighth. Yeah. Okay. What about the people that? Um, sorry, I've got to keep having to move the photos because they're in the way. Mm -hmm. The people who didn't qualify, so the people who came third and fourth in their blocks, they've got the same arrangement. The third and fourths are kept separate from the people they played in the first round. So A3 is there, A4 is there, can't meet until the final. The shoot the plate final and a playoff. And what about the people? These people are having a hard time, aren't they? They didn't do so well this morning, yeah. right? They also have lost the first the first round in the afternoon in the plate. They go to the saucer. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um so uh in a bigger tournament, you've got um you start off with the, the cup at the top or the championship at the top, you've got the you're the bowl for the quarterfinal losers. You've got the shield for the people who lose in the first round. You've then got the plate, the saucer, and then you've got to think of something else. I don't know, the tablecloth probably. All right. Um, the important thing is that everybody gets to play the entire program because frequently um, managers concentrate too too much on the um, the 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 top people and forget about the people at the bottom. The beauty of this system is when you've got um, got a knockout for, for everyone, if you get to a stage where somebody says to you at the end, it's a bit cold, I'm a bit tired, I can't be bothered to play off for 15th and 16th, don't lose any sleep over it, all right? If they don't want to play, they don't want to play. Yeah. If anybody wants to drop out at any stage, their opponent just gets a bye, yeah. all right? And down here, you know, you're playing for 13th to 16th. You've had a lousy time. If it's raining or something like that, these people are going to want to go home and just let them go home, you know. It's all about giving people a good time, isn't it? Yeah. I've banged on for far too long because I, I was hoping to finish, you know, in half an hour ago. Right. I hope that's some kind of use. Um, I'm sorry I've had to rattle it, rattle it through. Um, I did promise at the end I would talk about a swiss so if you'll indulge me for the benefit of the gentleman that's particularly um the for ac i'll just run through a swiss 
because it ah stops here right um the swiss is quite important uh that one will do so what you do with a swiss and this is where it's all gone horribly wrong and your format's gone for a burton you st you you may have started got some games already played so what you do in your first round of these swiss um this is where we've started out running running a swiss so you draw you draw people with a pack of cards or something like that and you draw people to play against each other in the first round when somebody wins you put a one there and a zero there if they've lost you then carry forward to the next round all the winners so albert stays at the top because he won he's joined by the next person on on one there christine goes to the top edward takes the next place because he's on one and Gillian takes the last place okay cream rises to the top you've got to deal with the losers bobby was the top loser so he comes down to there daphne was the second loser she comes down to there um, Frank comes down to there and Henry stays at the bottom. In the next round, you've got, I've, in each case, I've, I've got the top listed, per, the per, first person of the pair winning all the time just because it's easier. So you've got Albert and Edward are undefeated, so they're going to play there. You've then got Christine was the top, top person on one. She comes down and Gillian's the next person on one. Is everybody with this so far? Yeah. 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 This is a this is what we call a strict Swiss. But if you've only got this number of people, this is the way to do it. Yeah. If you come down then to round three, I don't know if I can put if I zoom out a bit. If I zoom out a bit, I can get round three alongside. I think I can. There we are. So this is where it starts to get tricky. Um, because you suddenly end up with Albert's doing, doing really well. He's got three wins. He must stay at the top. He's now He now hasn't got anybody on three wins. He's the only undefeated person. So he plays the next person on two that he hasn't played already. Okay? Which actually... Oh, it's Bob... You've tried to promote Bobby up, but actually it doesn't work because he played Bobby in the first round. Okay? So you have to put Bobby down here. OK, so this is where it gets really a bit on the tricky side. And I would suggest very strongly that you have um, like the block grid that we had earlier on with the players names written. So they've got a line, a line each, and they've also got a line coming down. You can mark off who's played who um, to avoid scheduling people on. If you if you've only got eight players, a Swiss is really tough. Because by the time you get round to court around four, yeah. you're essentially running a knockout. Yeah. Um, by the time you get round to five, you're starting to wish you hadn't put these certain people together yeah. and you can trip yourself up. Okay. So I'd strongly suggest really, if you've only got about eight in it to do something other than a Swiss, yeah. um, I would suggest you do. I talked to Richard Pepper about this because he runs one where he's got enough time to play six rounds, but he hasn't got enough round time to play seven. Seven is the all play all, isn't it? You've got eight players, a seven round all play all. And I suggested that um, he pre draws it all out and then has a certain round that he declares he's not going to play. Yeah. All right. And the easiest one is to have the round where people play one one if one one plays eight and two plays seven yeah that is the round to miss out because it's the one that's least contested yeah. um there we are um really good. sorry it's been a rattle through fantastic give me a ring if there's anything you want because um i can obviously i can bang on a long time about this i've been talking for an hour and a half i know it's half, half past have we got any questions <laughs> yeah Keith. Hi, Keith. Keith. Hi. Can I can I ask something, please? I'm yeah. running uh, three or four club tournaments shortly. Yeah. If the size of a block, if I've got say ten people in a yeah. in a tournament, do yeah. I have two blocks of five, or how best yeah. to arrange that? Okay. The one I didn't the one I didn't cover 
is if you've got um, um, if you've got ten players, um, yeah, you want to have two blocks of five. Okay. Yep. And we used to call it cross blocks. And essentially what happens is all the people in block A don't play each other, oh. but they play but they play all the people in block B. All right. Um, something I'll probably need a slide for, but all the people in block A play all the people in block B, which gives you five games. Yeah. Right. You then order the people in block A on the results they've had, albeit they haven't played each other, but they have all played the same opponents. Yes. You see? Yeah. So you can judge them because they've all played the same opponents. Is everybody with that one? I'll get a bit of paper and write it down. Yeah. Yeah. Get a bit of paper and write it down. I've, I've, we, we used to call it cross-blocking because you were all the players in one, in one block were going to mash in with the players playing across the others. So was, you were playing cross-block games. Yeah. Um, it's been decided that that's not a particularly good term. We now call it a, a, a pre-drawn Swiss because essentially what you're doing, you're saying these five players are going to play these five players. Okay. And, and just, a supplementary, if I may, supposing I've got 12, which I would put into three yep. blocks of four, can yes. I have, how do I have my semi-final or final out of the, the winners of those? Right. Okay, if you've got yeah, if you've got if you've got something that doesn't add up mathematically, lovely by four, yeah, I've got you. Okay, if you've got twelve, and maybe a, like Tony's got a three lawn club at, at mm, Elon, I was just yeah. going to say the same, yeah. So they run they run um, twelve. You've got a, you've got a choice depending on the level of player. You could have two blocks of six. Um, yep. It's kind of unsatisfactory if you have two blocks of six, and you only want to play seven games um or six games you've got two blocks of six is five games you then have semi-finals and finals so one yeah. plays two two plays one that's pretty straightforward the other thing you can do is have three blocks of four top two qualify plus ah. the plus the two fastest losers to use olympic expression Okay, so you'd look at the you look at the records of all the people who came third of the three people who came third and you take the best two third places, and the the worst third gets into the plate. And I've actually got plenty of time to do this because it's not on two, three, or four days. I'm running it over two, three, or four months throughout the pit the summer. Ah, so we've got right, time well, to to, to work time, all that. Yeah, you've got time to work all that. Yeah. Good. The last thing is the standard paperwork you can find on the CA website. There's a trick if you go to the CA website, I don't know if you've figured this one out, but on the little tabs along the top where you've got members, play, compete, if you click on them once, you get a page full of blurb with some, some links in and you've got to find all the links you want. The trick with the CA website is if you double click on that top menu, you get a drop down menu, which is much easier to navigate. So the one you want to be going to is compete. Double click on compete. And there's an then you come down to a tab called management. And when you hover over management, you get a side tab called called GC management. And that is where all the standard paperwork is. OK, and the standard paperwork for one and two days. On, and then within the a, a grid, You've got standard paperwork for um, um, there's twelve. I think it's twelve players. Um, it's twelve. There's fourteen. So I've just done it. Fourteen. 14 16, thank you. That's right, yeah. There's yeah. fourteen, sixteen, and twenty-four. Yeah. We're in the process of developing it, and lovely Richard Bilton is doing all the clever maths, all the clever um, computer work behind it. We will have put up one for twelve, and I'll encourage him to to do one for eight as well. Lovely. All right. And, okay. and then that, that then that will sort of work on the Excel file and in, in the same way as when yes. you demo. Yeah. Really. And when you go when you go to it, you've got an Excel version you can you can self-populate. Or if you're not confident with that and you don't like it, you can just download the PDF one and you can fill it in with your pen. Because that's excellent. Yeah. Good. All right. Okay. Uh, Chris, that was absolutely mm. fantastic. Thank you very, very much.
So mm. really, really yeah, yeah. I, I, oh, sorry. One, well, one last thing. I've been uh, using this as I've been using this as a mouse mat. I should give credit to that. Okay, which is the uh, tournament management by uh, Gaunt, Gaunt and Wheeler. They wrote that something like twenty years ago. And um, if anybody's a mathematician, there's lots of bedtime reading there. But basically, <laughs> what they what they what they did, we're still using today. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Very, Excellent. Very Thank you, Chris. I, I, yeah. I think, well, I, think well, I mean, obviously, if you want to learn much more, you, you go along to the one day course, I would suggest. Yeah. Um, look out for those in the future um, uh, fixture calendar, I guess. But many, many thanks. Thanks all for your, your uh, time if, if you've been to more of these. And we'll see you again in October. Thanks, okay. Thanks right. Paul. Thanks.